it comes up to $1,020 a month. Oh wow, I'm looking for my private jet. Okay. Bob, you wanna go shopping with me? I easily put way over 40 hours a week into what I do. And if you divide that out, just by a four, let's just say it's a 40 hour you know, work week, that comes out to $6.38 an hour on me. And you know, I'm supposedly part of this big, evil, flat earth conspiracy to make creation industries look bad. That's what they're coming after me for. Yeah, from what, 87 cents below minimum wage? Sorry, no, it doesn't work that way. So if you're looking at this whole flat earth thing with the idea that this is a get rich, get rich quick scheme, no. If you want to know how to get rich on YouTube, check out this website right here, this, this channel on YouTube. Have you ever heard of this website, How To Basic? First of all, it's a genius name for a YouTube channel. How To Basic, right? It's got, you know, how to change a tire, how to do this, you know. But when you click on it, you go to it, you're thinking, I want to know how do I install a door, or how do I you know, fix a computer? And you click on the video, and I just chose a short one here to show you what type of video you're going to get. Like, how to fix a leaky toilet. <laughs> That was a deal breaker for me. 
You got Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. You got Yeshua, Jesus Christ Himself, the Son of God, the Creator, telling us that all the stars will fall to earth. You got Peter and John in the New Testament telling us that all the stars are going to fall to earth. Well, we got a really big problem of Beetlejuice is headed our way, followed by Arcturus and the constellations and Andromeda. And oh, by the way, Andromeda is just one of billions and billions of galaxies out there. All of them are billions and billions of stars and you know planets around. All that's coming here. Somebody's lying. And I'm not prepared to say that it's Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, and John. No. Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Mitch Kaku, you guys are lying. Gene Roddenberry, George Lucas. Alright? All the stars are falling to earth. Somebody lying. There are floodgates or windows in the firmament, according to text you see there. Christ the Jew of Sending, stationary bulls set on pillars, according to text you see there. From Genesis to Revelation, the earth is consistently described. The Holy Spirit's five fathers as fixed and not moving, spinning, orbiting, etc. Circular with edges, corners, pillars, foundations, etc. Under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four. And I put these two up there. This is the interior of the model that I showed you there, essentially the footstool of God. Which is a better fit? For a stationary world set on a firm foundation of pillars under a solid dome within which the sun, moon, and stars will move in, which will accommodate all the stars falling to earth. Which one? <laughs> it's pretty easy. And you just allow the text to speak for itself. Now, of course, people look at that, they listen to things I say, and they say, well, why should we even trust the Bible? Why should we? That's a much bigger discussion, all right? We could spend a whole weekend talking about that. Um, in my early journey, people think that I just accept everything on blind faith. Why don't? I question my faith. I've questioned the Bible. I've had, I've wrestled with all the same arguments that Jared and others have posted. You know, and I understand some of the arguments are problem with the text being changed and people tampering and all that stuff. But you know what? That's why God allowed the Hebrew Greek and Aramaic text, text to be preserved. And why they pop out of places like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Or we can take them, look at the various English translations, and compare them to the earliest known remaining copies that are out there. And they're out there by the hundreds, in some cases thousands. Okay? I've looked into it. Now, there's certainly many books I can recommend. These are three books that were early in my own personal quest, I understand, that had an impact on me. Evidence in the bands of Irving, more evidence, and you know, revised versions of the new evidence and stuff like that. These are all by uh, Josh McDowell. Um, and of course, C.S. Lewis and many other people out there, Lee Strobel. A lot of people start out as atheists. I'm going to prove the Bible wrong. Guess what happens? <laughs> they end up proving it. It's right. And Matt Long just did a conference, uh, the Skyfall Fall conference just recently. You should check out his video. He did a good apologetic on it too, uh, talking about the trustworthiness of the scripture. And of course, I would point to my own personal experiences, but those are mine. You can't relate to them. Uh, you have to have experiences of your own. But I hear this one all the time, Bob. Yeah, but Bob, you're just making Christians look stupid. You ever hear that before? You ever said that before? They do it all by okay, themselves. Okay, I'm going to help you out with this a little bit. If you call yourself a Christian, you already look stupid. <laughs> you know, here's a new flash for you. <laughs> here's some of the things that we already believe. That you know, people who don't believe the Bible, who don't have that faith, uh, you know, they look at us and they're like, you know, we believe that the universe and everything was created in six little days. We believe in two magic trees. Hmm. In a talking snake. <laughs> we believe that Moses split the Red Sea. A dude with a talking donkey, like Shrek. <laughs> the walls of Jericho crumbling, crumbling down with the trumpets. Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. Right? Now, how do you know how to leave the system words mean things? Right? If he was taking authority over the sun and moon and the real that the way that everything worked is the way we were taught in the Christian principle. You know, he said, Sun and moon stand out still over, and he told them to stand still over very specific geographic locations, too. So do you think God and the angels were going, well, well, geez, you know, he doesn't understand the perfect because he's not having to come out. Yeah, I don't like it. Let's stop the earth. Because <laughs> that's the only way that would be possible, right? Is to stop the earth from rotating and stop the moon from rotating and orbiting. And never mind the fact that we have wind shear and oceans and everything else have all kinds of problems. And after they did their little thing out there, completed their battle, and you think God's like, okay, spin it back up again. <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible that says we're spun to begin with. In fact, it's like 67 verses that tell you the place is stationary, not moving, fixed. Right? But no, the Bible tells us Joshua will have some more stuff. The length of a dude's hair gave him supernatural strength. Wow. That's awesome. 
Do you guys show off the fiery furnace for making them harm? A dude spends three days and three nights in a fish and pops out and starts preaching. Oh, here's a good one. A senior, born of a virgin, who walked on water, did miracles, died, rose again in three days. I'm out for a few more weeks, and then flew into the sky like Superman with the promise of returning on a flying horse, followed by a floating city. Huh. All that sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Unless you have to believe it. People out there who don't believe that, they think we're crazy already. So if your big concern is, don't get in the fire open and you make Christians look stupid, dang, I'm helping you out here. <laughs> we don't need any problem looking stupid. Uh, you know, I mean, we got charismatic wackiness, and people flipping around on the ground laughing, and, you know, prayer cloths. You buy this prayer, you know, donate 100 dollars and you get a prayer cloth. That we personally blessed, angel feathers and all that stuff. How many failed rapture predictions have we had, right? That the Bible guarantees. Yeah, we have no problem with this, do we? But you know what? Uh, let me encourage you here. Because if that looks silly to you, wait till I show you in the next session, when we come back after the break, what they believe. What the other side believes is infinitely more stupid than anything that I can show you here on the screen. And when you look into the beliefs of other ancient cultures, it doesn't take you long. You start looking into the other ancient cultures. The Sumerians had a similar belief of a closed world system. Same thing with the Egyptians and the Greeks. You look into the Native American tribes, the, the Mayan, the Incan, the Navajo cosmology, same thing. Look into the Norse and Irish uh, cosmology. You can even go see the movie Thor. Look at how they depicted Asgard. Right? They're being true to their ancient texts in the movies right there. What caught my eye, though, in this rendition right here, see the big spire they have there in the center right there? How many of you have heard of Mercator before? If you've been to public school, you've probably seen the Mercator map, right? Hanging up on the wall right there. Yeah, you can look into this. What did Mercator know? There's a letter that he wrote to John D. in the year 1577. Look up the letter John D. that uh, Mercator wrote to John D. where he describes in great detail, by the way, he's got to make this map. You've seen. He describes a great what they don't show you though. We've seen this map before, but what you don't see in the original map that he created was in the legend area there. He had another section talking about the North Pole, and this is what he, what he depicted in his map. And other ancient maps have very similar depictions as well. This is what's the North Pole. So what Joshua was talking about earlier. Yeah, I want to go to the North. I have no interest in going to the South. Yeah. It's way colder down there, way more hostile, and well, frankly, what's in the North to me is way more interesting. You know, uh, because the ancients were all talking about this, and as, as recent as 1577, Mercator, the guy that drew all our maps that we've seen, talked about this in great detail about a four mountainous islands divided by four rivers and large rivers that he called in drawing seas, and he says they're so powerful that if you had the misfortune to get caught in one of the one of these rivers, you weren't going to get not get out. Those rivers are going to suck you into the middle, but there's a whirlpool, a 480 mile across whirlpool. That's going to suck you into uh, that surrounds a massive 33 mile circumference magnetic mountain that the ancients called Mount Meru in the center there, or the Rupus Negra. Many cultures actually share this belief. Mercator, of all people, documented documents quite thoroughly and had included it on his maps of the world. And so you, know, you look at what he's saying, and you look at what all the other ancient cultures are saying, and if you're being intellectually honest, with yourself and with the words being used, the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, in your Bible, this is what you end up with. This is, you know, our conception that some people from Lowe's Bible software depicted this. This is the Hebrew concept of the universe. Now, they don't like me showing this right here. In fact, they came after me for copyright for doing it. And they said I was sharing paid, paid, paid content for free. I'm like, well, you guys share it. If you buy their software, their software is very expensive software. Okay. But if you buy their very expensive software, you get to this page right there, there's a little share button. And if you click the little share button, that allows you to take their big content and put it through their software on social media. Once it gets on social media, it's out there. And they use it in their own materials, Dr. Michael Heiser. Now say it out loud with me. Michael Heiser does not believe in the flat earth. Okay, I have to continually say that because there's always some idiot out there trying to say that I'm using Michael Heisman's work to say that he believes in the flat earth. No, he doesn't. He's being intellectually honest with himself and with the text by saying, look, this is what the Bible says. You know, he's an ancient uh, Semitic language expert, okay? And, and very knowledgeable in ancient Near East and cultures and stuff like that. And he's going through the text, going through the Bible, being intellectually honest with it, saying, this is what they believe. Now, he personally does not believe it. 
Maybe there's people who look at Microsoft. But the problem is, a whole lot of people are seeing this picture, realizing for themselves that the Holy Spirit, I believe, is confirming in their spirit when they're reading it, and saying, well, this is what the Bible says. And now they're back and they get really upset about it because they get a whole lot of converts from their own software. <laughs> and I'm like, do you, do, you, do you stand behind your software? Do you stand behind your scholars with letters under their name? Better yet, do you stand behind what you say the Bible says? And why are you coming after me personally? When so many other people are out there sharing this. Because people are converting. Yeah. Here's an earlier video that I did when I was first looking at these graphics and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I, I can see now that this is what the Bible is saying. How does this stuff work? And I was trying to figure out how does the night and day work, the four seasons and all that kind of stuff. This is the video. And some of you may have these questions. Well, how does it work? This was an earlier video I did on that question. So very early on in my investigation, as you can see, May 26, 2015, I was trying to figure out how does the sun work over the flat earth, and I came up with this model. Now, I stated right from the start that this was not meant to be to scale. This one's a little better. Uh, I still think the sun may be a little bit too big, but you see the sun going over the equator here at an altitude of approximately 3,000 miles, uh, according to this scale right here. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, what is the sun acting like a spotlight? No, it's not acting like a spotlight. And to prove that, I'll bring in a little 3D object here, and I'll bring in a little dome on the top of it here, to show you that this light is thrown off in all directions, up, down, all around. It's not a spotlight. So, all the critics out there, you can stop saying that. It's not shining in a spotlight. It's what's known in 3D as a point light, that has been adjusted with a limited light throw attenuation. Now, shortly after I did that video, I was trying to figure out how the Four Seasons work, and you can see that video right here on YouTube, how the Four Seasons work on the Flat Earth model. And that was really interesting. And I actually discovered this quite by accident, really. This video came as a result of me trying to figure out on the globe how does the 24 hour sun work? And so I used Stellarium, which is heliocentric globe based software. And I, you can put your location of observation wherever you want. So I put it in Antarctica, I think it would be in the Ross Ice Shelf area or somewhere like that, wherever you supposedly can see 24 hour sun. So I put my camera there. And then I pulled it, you can adjust the camera and the type of lens you use, and, and you can adjust it such that you can look at each cardinal point north, south, east, west, or in the case of what I did, I pulled the camera into the earth and used the fisheye lens uh, setting so that I could see all four carbon points at the same time. And then I just got rid of the ground plane and removed the stars. So the only thing I could see then is the sun and moon. And I set it to record for a whole year, real fast, and recorded that. And in this software, the Ocentric Close Base software showed the sun and moon speeding up and slowing down. Uh, as it was creating these circles. And I just thought, I wonder what that would look like on the flat earth map, on an AD map. So I just superimposed it on that, and then I just flipped it horizontally because I'm looking down instead of looking up. And it actually showed the sun and moon going between the tropics and slowing down when it gets in the northern so called hemisphere and speeding up when it gets in the southern hemisphere. But of course, the critics look at this and they ask a reasonable question Does it change speed? Because the circle is bigger out here in the wind time going on the topic of Capricorn. So when it's speeding the sun up and then slowing it back down, it was constantly changing directions and speeds with your model. Yes, it was. Again, heliocentric globe-based software created that. And interestingly enough, I found a video online that a guy went apparently on the Tropic of Cancer a certain time of the year on the equator and on the Tropic of Capricorn and videotaped the moon going across the screen. Now, he had it at double speed, and I made it a lot faster just for the sake of this video, but sure enough, the moon was moving at different speeds across his lens. Fastest over the Tropic of Capricorn, medium over the equator, and slowest over the Tropic of Cancer. I'd be curious to see how the Clovers explain this, but at least the moon here reflected exactly what Stellarium, heliocentric globe-based software, had depicted. And I can only assume that the moon is doing this, the sun must be doing the same thing. Though I'm unaware of any tests that have been done in that regard. How crazy is that? I think it was Dave Marsh that did that video. I don't remember 
I'm sure who did it, but it literally showed that. Heliocentric, globe-based software showed the sun speeding up and slowing down. So uh, how would that work in the current month? I have no idea. Um, but when it ultimately came down to the Bible, looking at it, the firmament was truly the key for me. It's what sealed the deal in more, more ways than one. Unquestionably, the thing is hard. According to Job 37, 18, firm, Proverbs 8, 28, is pouring the waters above. Genesis 1, 6 through 8, Psalm 148, 4, attached to the earth, Amos 9, 6, within which you will place the sun, moon, and stars. Genesis 1, 14 through 19, and 19, 1 through 6, and upon which his throne sits. Ezekiel 1, 26, Isaiah 66, 1. Clearly, this is a very important issue to you Psalm 19, 1. The only model that accommodates every aspect of the firm is the circuit of being closed for a while. The only way around this is to grossly misrepresent the scriptures, yanking the true meaning of the words used out of context, and fantasizing about definitions for those words which are not even remotely supported by the text or the historical context in which the scriptures were written. And when I took Hebrew, they, I was taking Hebrew 101, and they were telling me, that there's an idiom that says if every letter has seven meanings, then every word has seven meanings. And they didn't have numbers that the Hebrew letters substitute as numbers, so that the letters themselves have numerical value. But each letter has meanings in and of themselves. And they have what they call a two or three letter, uh, I think it's called a shrash, root word, upon which other, you know, you can have prefixes or suffixes to make more words. But those words will have the inherent meaning not only of the word itself, but also the root word and the letters that make up the word. So that's hence the, the idiom. So when I was looking at the letters that make up the word rakia in Hebrew, you have uh, these four letters right here. The meaning of the uh, resh is the highest, most important. The kof, the last, final, future. The vav, or uh, yeah, uh, no, excuse me, yod, uh, is work and the I see, understand, and reveal. So you put it together in a sentence, you got the firmament means the highest, most important, final, uh, last, final, future work to see, understand, and reveal. How cool is that? How cool is it that we're having this discussion in a place called the firmament? Yeah. That's just awesome. I think it's very important this information is coming out now of all time in human history, right? The 21st century. With all the stuff we claim that we know, right? We're coming to an understanding of the firmament. And that's the meaning of it? Why? Then you start going out there and doing your own tests, like I mentioned earlier, and you start finding out that terrestrial based observations consistently confirm a flat Earth. And still, you got people out there saying stuff like this. The Earth is round. Here's the proof. Remember Felix von Hartmann? He jumped from the edge of space a few years back to perform the highest parachute jump ever. Well, that was on a live feed in front of hundreds of thousands of people. And you can clearly see the Earth's curvature. So yes, there is tons of proof that Earth is a sphere. Yes, yeah. There's another one, you know, right before it hit the ground, right? Five feet, curvature. I, this, I posted this on Facebook literally last week, right? There's a, a globe in the region of Earth that's being depicted from the ISS. And people were defending the picture on the bottom. <laughs> right? That's the Persian Gulf right there, right? I think it uh, go over is the Gulf of um, Aqaba. Hermos, something like that. Straight, straight from Hermos. Yeah. It, the, and their picture right there, that's like the entire northern hemisphere. Yeah. And they are telling me that that's an accurate picture and telling me I don't have any critical thinking skills. Really? Wow! That's on my Facebook page from last week. So when I first got into this, of course, yeah, everybody's like, oh, there it is! Oh, you've ever been to the beach! You've seen the curve of the earth! It's cathartic for me to say that that way. It helps me. So I started going to the beach and taking pictures over and over and over again. This is in California. And I went up into uh, the, the mountains of Malibu up there and looking across the whole distance that you see there in the distance. Uh, background there, that's like a hundred miles across right there, and everything I did, taking pictures and putting a straight line on there, there's no curve there. I'm not seeing any curve. You tell me that there's curve, but you just take it, take pictures of it without using a fish eye lens, and here you see, there's no curve there. Then I met a guy who was helping me out my scene project, another writer. He grew up in the Ventura area as a lifeguard, and there's this place called Anacoppa Arch, 
And from where he was, someone's like 20 miles away, you could see it on a clear day. You could see he had a couple arch. And it's only like 40 feet high, I think it was. So he's like, wait a minute. So he goes to a buddy of his that was like a math professor at the university. And he says to the guy, you live on the globe, right? Yeah, of course. Well, what's the math of that? And if you're out the math of that, it's roughly 80 miles squared. So he said, if we had an object that's about 40 feet high, uh, let's say 20 miles away, you're telling me we shouldn't be able to see it. Oh, absolutely not. And the guy goes, well, the problem is, we've all seen it. And the math professor goes, what are you talking about? He goes, they had a cop on arch. All of a sudden, you're hearing the flint sound of sound effect going off in his head, right? Right? Every time Fred gets confused, you hear that? You go, <laughs> it goes off, and the guy's like, what? He turns around, he's looking at the map, or he's trying to figure out where did he, where did he go wrong, you know, because they've all seen it. And that's the problem. We, that's why so many people are converting, is because we are seeing things on Earth for ourselves that you are not supposed to be able to see.